It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The same way he took the cup of wine after supper. He gave thanks and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you the truth, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. Do this in remembrance of me. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to this service of worship of Union Church of Manila. We gather this day to worship and celebrate the Lord Jesus Christ. Today is World Communion Sunday. World Communion Sunday is a day each year. It's the first Sunday in October, and it happens to precede our anniversary month of Union Church of Manila. And it is a day that the worldwide church acknowledges that we take communion, that we celebrate communion and the Lord's Supper as a worldwide church, as a community of all nations that is united in Christ. And we, we lift that up and we say we, we take communion today, not only as the Union Church of Manila, but as the worldwide church. And so we, we thank God that we are uh, united in Christ and that we remember him this day together with Christians all around the world. We celebrate him and what he has done and we remember him. So today is World Communion Sunday. We're going to hear the words of Jesus spoken in different languages in our service today. Uh, if you are able and uh, are, are able to do this, we, we do invite you, if you've not done this already or had the chance, to prepare bread and juice uh, that we may take the Lord's Supper together later in the service following the sermon. So uh, please gather those elements if, if you can pr prior to that time. 
Uh, and as I mentioned, next Sunday is the anniversary Sunday of Union Church of Manila, 106 years of God's faithfulness to and through this community of faith to the nations. Um, we'll have a special time to celebrate God's faithfulness, just recognize that God is still faithful uh, this year and every year uh, on the anniversary Sunday, especially during this time of worldwide crisis. God has remained faithful to this community, through this community, to reach all nations. We uh, sincerely hope that you can join that Sunday in worship and celebrate this truly uh, set-apart uh, day uh, uh, that we recognize that God is still faithful to this community and through this community. It's on October 11th, uh, which happens to be the exact day of the founding of Union Church. Falls on the exact day this year, this Sunday's worship service. The day before our anniversary Sunday on October 10, that's Saturday, that's this coming Saturday, we have a wonderful opportunity, and I'm quite excited about this, in a uh, what we're calling a locked down family retreat for UCM and the families of UCM. We have a special guest speaker that will address us in the form of a webinar for this retreat, a wonderful man of God and Dr. Ramesh Richard that we've been praying and working with him and he's going to address us in the, as the UCM family and the families that comprise the UCM family during this time. The title of this retreat is called Testing Spiritual Health. We all know that we've been in a time of testing, testing as a church family, testing in our individual families. And so I want to invite you to go ahead and sign up and register for this retreat. Go ahead and do that now. The QR code is there. There are other ways to register, but this is the week uh, to please sign up for that. And we'd love to see as many of the UCM families there as, as we can. Also, something I'm very excited about to let you know about is our upcoming opportunity in the UCM University. The UCM University, or UCMU uh, for, short, for short. This is uh, something we are doing. This is uh, the church's venue to provide Christian education to the UCM community. This first study series will be an introduction to the Old Testament. It's going to be uh, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. Classes will begin on October 24th and run up to December, 20, uh, December 12th. This is going to be a total of six Saturdays that we are inviting the entire UCM uh, family to attend. Uh, this will be a wonderful way to, to ground us as a church, starting at the Old Testament, to start to ground us in Scripture. And the plan is for UCMU to continue. So we'll do six months, six weeks rather, of the Pentateuch and continue through the Old Testament, get into the New Testament, and go through, the plan is to go through the entire Scriptures uh, in one year. So that's UCM University. Again, uh, would love to have your participation. It's a commitment to all six classes. The first 100 people to register will receive a Zoom link, and up to 15 people will be able to participate, to actually physically be here on campus. So it'll be a hybrid. We'll have people in the classroom, and we'll also have a Zoom set up online uh, to uh, launch and to begin this uh, UCM University where we'll, be, we'll just be immersed in the Scripture together, Pastor Chad leading us through that time of teaching and learning. The information on how to register is in the bulletin and on the UCM online platforms. So please see that, pray for that, UCM University coming up. And lastly, would like you know to really invite you, if you've been tuning in to the worship services of UCM, and you've been, you've been touched by God's grace, and you, you want to know more about who is Jesus Christ, what does, what does his life mean for my life, you want to lean in to understand and ex uh, the life of Christ and what that means and accept Christ as your Savior and your Lord. And you would like someone to, to talk with you about that and, and sort of facilitate a conversation perhaps. We would love to do that with you. We, we, are, we are ready to respond to you here at Union Church. Please just send us an email uh, there on the screen, ucmcares at unionchurch.ph. 
and we have someone dedicated to monitoring that email that will get right back to you and we can get in contact with you and we would be very happy and blessed uh, for the chance to guide you in coming to know the Lord and growing in your faith in that way. So let's continue now in worship. Uh, as we pray, let's bow, the, bow our heads if you would like to join me in that way and let's pray as we continue in worship this day. Lord, we bow our heads and we remember and acknowledge many around the world who bow also and, and just come before you in this posture of humility and prayer. Lord, our faith is not located in a building. It is not located in a, in a certain area and not others. We participate in a worldwide communion of saints. And Lord, just bring, would you, would you help bring us to that understanding that we are certainly not alone in what we're going through, Lord, but we go through and we endure with a worldwide communion of brothers and sisters in Christ. We are the body of Christ. You gave your life for your church, Lord, and that we, in knowing you, know your life, that true life, that you provide. And we thank you for that great truth. We thank you for the faith that you've given us by your grace. And Lord, we, we, we celebrate you this day. We, we honor you. We revere you. And please help us in this, in this day uh, to, to remember what your life meant and, and what that means for us. And, and not only as in, in, in our individual lives and in our communities and our different nations, but in the world. Lord, we're one family, one united family in Christ, and that you are leading and guiding and bringing us to a great and glorious future, even when it seems that's hard to believe. Lord, that is truth. That is the truth, and you are there, and you are bringing us there. So thank you for that, Lord. Uh, help us prepare our hearts to receive communion, take communion together. Prepare our hearts to first hear the word, hear your word proclaimed to us, encourage us, challenge us. Uh, we know you're with us. We thank you so much for being with us. Um, we love you, we thank you, we honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. Fight for me. 
Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we offer to you our words of praise and thanksgiving as we commune with you today. We acknowledge, Lord, that you are the giver of life, the author and perfecter of our faith, and the redeemer of our broken souls. We praise you because you are still faithful to our church this past 106 years. From generation to generation, you have sustained us and are still sustaining us, even in this pandemic. You know perfectly well what we need, that we may give back the glory that is due you. So we ask that as your church, equip us and steer us to be your hands and feet, that we may give food to the hungry, comfort to the grieving, prayer for the sick, and be a solace to those weighed down by depression. Help us to always clothe ourselves with kindness, generous with both our hearts and time, money and possessions, to give to those who are in need. We ask now that you look over our children and their faith as they face the impact of this pandemic in their young life. May they make you their place of refuge and find you as their savior and faithful friend who would help them through in their struggles. Protect us from the evil one who continues to prowl like a lion, looking for those among us who have been weakened along the way. Guide and protect our pastors and their families. Give wisdom and understanding to those who lead and serve us in this church. And when problems and anxieties continue to trouble us, Remind us that you will always be our source of eternal hope and glory. Walk alongside us, O Holy Spirit, and let your light shine that we may be the church and your people who will shine for your glory and be a source of help and comfort to those around us. We trust in your unfailing love and pray in your mighty name. Amen. Let us affirm our faith by reciting the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to the dead. The third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. 
Amen.
Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're tuning in uh, around the globe this morning and whatever time it may be. We are delighted to have you with us to celebrate World Communion Sunday. As you've already seen by now this morning, we are really focusing on a celebration that is happening in every country, in every part of the world, where we are focusing on that unifying factor that brings us all together under Jesus Christ. Uh, and that is the table, the Lord's table, where, where we look and we focus the centerpiece of our faith and remembering what Christ has done for us. And, and when we think about the Lord's table, you, you know, the, this bread and this cup, it, it is one of the longest traditions in the history of the church. It has been practiced billions of times by billions of people across the globe for thousands of years who have gathered together and repeated the commands of Jesus to take this bread and break it in remembrance of me and take this cup and drink it in, in remembrance of me. If you remember, this all started in, in the Gospels where Jesus gathers the 12 disciples in the upper room and, and the night he was betrayed and they ate a meal. And, and he says, this meal is going to become very important to the history of our faith. It, it's going to be very Significant, And what, it, what is interesting is what was meant to be something that displayed unity in the body of Christ, that displayed the oneness in Christ, has sometimes become one of the most controversial and dividing issues in the body of Christ currently. You, you know, when we come to this bread and we come to this cup, we, we debate it, don't we? I mean, we debate its meaning. We debate its theological significance. We, we debate how we are to practice it. Some places, everyone can take it. Some places, just a few can take it. In the Middle Ages, only the priests could partake of it. So, some debate if it should be done corporately and whether it can even be done privately. Some debate what kind of bread it should be. Should it be just a regular loaf of bread? You know, you go some places, it's unleavened bread. Some places, it's a little styrofoam wafer. It, you, there's all different approaches to what this means. Some places, you know, you do use grape juice. Some places, you use wine. It reminds me of the story of the little boy who was a pastor's kid, a Baptist church. You know, Baptists, they, they, we, we uh, use grape juice all the time. And uh, uh, he was, uh, his father was at the blue, uh, Red Cross donating blood. And uh, his, the little boy asked his mom, hey, where's dad? And she said, well, he's, he's down and he's donating his blood. And the little boy said, well, we all know that it's not real blood. It's grape juice, right, mom? Well, we, we debate these things of what this means. These are the things that we learn as children, that this isn't real blood. This is just grape juice. You know, some say we should do it every time we gather. Some say we should do it just once a month. Sometimes some say we do it uh, just once a year. And the tradition I come out of, it was accompanied by foot washing. You were supposed to wash people's feet when you took the Lord's Supper as Jesus did with the disciples. So there are so many ideas about the Lord's table and, and communion and so many traditions in the history of the church and so the irony here is that what Christ was using as an example to bring unity into the body of Christ, the church has splintered off and created divisions and points of contention all along the way. And yet in the early church, uh, this idea of the Lord's table started with what was called the agape meal. Uh, where it was taken as a supper, and sometimes it was taken throughout the week, and sometimes it was taken daily. In fact, if you look in Acts chapter 2, the first practice of the church, they gathered together, and it says they gathered for a meal day by day. And, and they came together, and they shared the table, and at the table, they not only shared life, but then they would remember when they came to the bread and to the cup, they came and they remembered what Christ did. And that was part of their worship, was eating together as one. And as they were united as one, they remembered that Christ's body was broken for them and his blood was shed for them. 
And, and, and really that's, you know, when we think about what happens at the table, that's where we do share life. That is where we do come to, into unity. That is where we do serve one another. Literally, as I serve my plate and I put the bread in front of you and say, eat, I, I'm serving you. It is the demonstration of real service, of uh, uh, satisfying even our basic needs at the place of the table, at the place of, uh, of, of putting sustenance within us and, and sustaining us in this meal and, and nourishing and refreshing us. We, we do that at the table and then we bring Christ in. And we remember all of this and it's such a significant place. And that's what it was originally designed as in the early church and Unfortunately, through the years, the supper has kind of changed, and to some, it's just become a kind of a tradition. We do it, you know, once a month. We go to church, and we take a little wafer, and we have a little juice and, or a little thing of wine, and uh, we, we've done our spiritual obligation for the month. Or it's become even a theological argument for some, just a routine. For some, it's even uh, an incantation, you know? It's, you know uh, it's a magical potion for some people. And to me, it really is amazing that humanity can take something as simple as a meal that was given to remind us of Christ's suffering and his work on the cross for us and to remind us of our unity for one another. We, we take something that's really simple as a meal and we sort of create a controversy over it and, and create division over something so basic. Yet, here's the wonderful part of World Communion Sunday. On World Communion Sunday, we are called to remember that despite the plurality of practice and thought regarding the Lord's table, we are something, we are part of something that is bigger than ourselves, that we are part of this universal body of Christ that is remembering him today in every part of the globe. I love that thought, right? That right now around the globe, we're gathered together and we're all flocking to his table and sharing in his body. You know, there's something I, I like to do sometimes in my office. It's, it, it's, it's kind of strange and uh, I'll bring you into this practice of mine that I, I, I do every couple of months. I, I, I like to go onto Google Maps and just identify a country that I'm praying for. And then I like to go into a particular city on Google Maps like here in this case, uh, I have one in Pakistan, Sindh, Pakistan, the one most recently, you know. And then when I go to Sindh, Pakistan, I like to look up on the internet churches in Sindh, Pakistan. And this is what I found uh, when I did that. I found St. Thomas's Cathedral, Sindh, Pakistan. Here's some of the people in it. And, and it's a combination of a Scottish, Presbyterian, and Methodist church. They all came together in 1970. And they've established this community of faith. And you know what I like to do? I like to just peruse who they are. And then I begin to think, I'm part of that. <laughs> We're part of that. We're part of the body of Christ. They share something that I share. And then I, I did another one. I went to uh, Lebu, Chile, to the Iglesia Evangelica Pentecostal. You, you know, and there's a picture of some of the people here. And, 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 and I like to think, yeah, I'm part of that. And there's little pockets like this and all over the globe and this bread unites us and brings us together in and with Christ. Even Jesus said in John chapter 15, he says, I am the vine and you are the branches. And if you think of the world as the branches, there's all these branches going out. You, you know, you think of the vineyard. I used to have a, a vine in my backyard, a grapevine, and, 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 and there's always new branches going all different directions. And yet there's the base and we're all connected and that sap is flowing through all of those branches. And, and that's what's transpiring in the world. And I think that the table reminds us of that this morning, that we are all coming to the table of Jesus Christ united. And so today, what I would like to do is we take a look at our study, our time of study. I would like to address the, uh, how Paul uh, looks at the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and what it meant for the Christians in Corinth and, and what we can glean from that for today because Paul provides very specific directives 
as to how to approach the table. And I think those directives are very important for us today. So before we take a look at that text, let's just invite the Lord into our study together. Lord, we pray that we would just come to the table recognizing everything that you want us to recognize in the table today. And that you would be honored and glorified as we think about what the table means for us and what it meant for the early church and and how you want us to practice this act of World Communion Sunday here at Union Church of Manila this year. We ask this in your name. Amen. Well, if you go to Acts, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17, Paul says this. He says, but in the following instructions, I do not commend you. He starts off with a negative approach. He's talking about the Lord's Supper and he says, you know, you're taking the Lord's Supper, but you're doing it wrong. (laughs) I don't commend you. And it is possible that you can approach the Lord's table incorrectly. We need to establish that. And because the early church in in Corinth, many of them approached it in the wrong atmosphere or the wrong mentality. And he says this, he says, I don't commend you. Because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe in part, uh, for, for there must be factions among you, in order that those who are genuine among you to may be recognized. But when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in sight, for in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. And one goes hungry and another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. <laughs> Paul said he's highlighting here an array of problems that existed in the early church over the Lord's Supper. And, and they were coming to the table with a wrong practice and a wrong mentality. See, this idea of how incorrectly approaching the table isn't just a 21st century thing. It's a perduring issue in the history and the life of the church. And in the case of the church of Corinth, he, he identifies a couple of things. He says, well, first of all, there's divisions among you. You're coming to the table and, and you're fighting with one another. How can you come to the table of unity and there be divisions among the body of Christ? Because all in Christ and in the loaf we are united together and yet there are factions and divisions among you. He says, that's not how it needs to be. That's not part of the body of Christ. And then he says, and on top of the divisions, there's a whole lot of selfishness going on. Why? Because there were people that were coming to the table and they were gorging themselves They were even drinking so much that they were becoming intoxicated. You know, and they're walking away just intoxicated and stuffed because they've eaten so much. But then there were others who didn't get anything. All the food had been gone. It's like standing in the front of the line at the potluck dinner and loading your plate up. And then all those at the very end, they get nothing. He says, what what are you doing? That, That is pure selfishness. And he says in verse 22, he says, shall I praise you for that? I'm not going to praise you. I'm not going to commend you for this. This isn't the right approach. And even look at what he says in verse 20 here. He says, when you come together, it's not even now the Lord's supper that you're eating. Oh, you think you're coming to the Lord's table. You think you're practicing something sacred. You think you're doing something holy, but you're not. You're being selfish and it's no longer of any significance because of the selfishness and the divisions that are among you because you're completely missing the point of what the table is all about. You see, the table is supposed to speak of our love for one another. It's supposed to speak of our willingness to serve one another in the body of Christ. In fact, if you look in John chapter uh, 13, when, when Jesus comes to the table and, and the, the account of John Remember the story, they're they're at the table, they're taking the supper together and Jesus, he he puts down the the foot basin and he puts the towel in in his waist there and he goes and he begins to wash the disciples' feet and he he washes Peter's feet to Peter's protest and and, and Jesus says, no, Peter, 
You have no part in me if you don't let me do this because this is what I'm about. I'm the suffering servant who came to serve. I didn't come to be served, I came to serve. And then he looks at them all in the face. He looks, I can see him sort of looking at each one in the eye and saying, as I've done to you. Now, when you come to this table, you do to one another. This table is a place of serving one another. And you need to understand that if you're not serving one another, then then you don't have any place at my table. Because at my table, we serve one another in the body of Christ. See, there's no room for selfishness at the table of Jesus Christ. I put number one on your outline. If you're following along, jot this down this morning. The Lord's table teaches me to have a servant's heart. Have a servant's heart where it's not uh, about my desires and my wants, but it's about looking at the people that are around me in the body of Christ and understanding how I can be serving them and washing their feet. And I do believe that this is a serious issue for some in the life of the modern church that views the church through somewhat of a consumer lens rather than the lens of a servant. The lens that says, I want to be recognized or I want to be fed. I want to be put on the pedestal. I want the music that I like that feeds me. I want to gorge myself on the spiritual food that's appropriate for me with the deepest teaching. I I want my feet washed. And all of that, this is consumer model about what I am going to get if I go to this place instead of coming with the mentality and being transformed by Jesus Christ that says, as I'm part of this body, Lord, help me not to look at what I want for me, but transform myself to be somebody who would wash the believer's feet. If that's your mentality, you know very well what the table, you grasp the table. Paul says, that's the kind of person, then you're taking the cup. If you don't have that, he says, you, you have no part of the table. It's not the Lord's table you're taking. So as we come today, now is a good time to take inventory of our lives as we come to the table on this World Communion Sunday and say, am I serving the body of Christ? And and, and you know, even in a COVID world, we can do that. We can call people up. We can send them text messages. We can send them food. We can even invite small groups into our home to have meals. We can, we can pray for others. We, we, we can figure out some way, even in a COVID world, how we can serve brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. And I even encourage you this morning, after you come out from the table, to say, let me think about today how I can serve one of my brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. How can I wash someone's feet today? That's what the table is about. It's washing the feet of our other brothers and sisters. But notice what Paul says next. I want you to drop your eyes now down to verse 23 and we'll go through verse 25. He says this, he says, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood and do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now, what happens here, Paul brings in the elements. He brings in the bread and he brings in the cup, the wine. We call them the elements at the table. And whatever your theological sort of standing is or belief regarding the contents or the substance of the bread and the wine, and let just so you know, at UCM we have a wide array of people who have a wide view of what is constituted here at this table. We have people who take what's called a, a transubstantiation view that this actually becomes the real body and blood of Christ. We have sort of the Lutheran view that scholars or Lutherans don't call it this, but uh, Reformed scholars gave it a name called consubstantiation where Christ is, is in and under and with the elements in this. And then 
There's the reform view, the Calvinistic view uh, uh, um, that says that, that Christ is spiritually present in the elements. And then there's the Zwingli view. The Zwingli, or it's called the memorial view that says that when we do this, this is just an act of remembering what Christ has done. So uh, by the way, at UCM, all of those views are present. Now, with all of those views that are present, how do we come to the table? I think there is something in symbolism in the bread and in the cup that we can all rally around and be reminded of at this time. And this is that this bread, no matter how you slice it, it's still the same bread, isn't it? It's made of the same stuff. It's, it's the same ingredients, the same materials. When I divide this bread and I break it, does it, this become like wonder bread and this become banana bread? It doesn't, it doesn't break into different types of bread. And I think what has happened in the body of Christ, we take this and we have all these different types of bread. You know, I'm a mongo bread or, and I'm a fua fua mini loaf and I'm a, a pan de rosa and, and I'm a, a Spanish bread and I'm a pancake uh, and, and I'm a, a butter toast and, and, and some of us are even muffins. I mean, we take this and we divide ourselves up into all these different categories. And we emphasize the different types of bread that we are and the different approaches to, to the body of Christ. And we forget that, that it's all about his body. And that we were all baked into the same loaf. That this is his body. And the, the Bible says that we are part of that body of Christ and united together. And this cup... You know, when we pour it out and we drink it, you, you know, to some it's not lemonade and then to some it's not like white wine and then some it's red wine and some it's a Chardonnay and, and some of it's, you know, some of it's Gatorade or soda. It's not like that. It's all the same substance of his blood and we are all united in Christ and united with each other. And the symbolism of that is clear in the body and the blood of Christ on the table. In fact, if you were to back up in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the chapter right before this one, Paul says this, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a, underline it, participation in the blood of Christ? And the bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? He says, you are participating in Christ and we are all participating together. We are mystically unified in Christ. I love that concept. Remember this idea of the vine and the branches, the sap that flows through the vine is flowing through all of us. We share that same sap and yet we, well, I'm this branch and I'm that branch and this branch, but we are in World Communion Sunday, we are reminded that we are united in the body and in the blood of Jesus Christ as we take and we eat and we drink from the same loaf and the same cut reminds us that we're, we are part of the body of Christ. In fact, go to Ephesians chapter four, talking about the church. I love how Paul puts it. He says, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Notice what he says. He says, there is one body, circle it. If you have your Bible, circle that word. There is one body. There are not multiple bodies. There is not Spanish bread and there's not pan de rosa and, and cupcakes and, and pan cake. There's not all these different. There is just one body, the universal body of Christ. There is one body. Now, notice what he says. He doesn't just start there. Then he goes, stop there. He says, and then there's one spirit, just as you were called to, what? Say it with me. One hope that belongs to your call. And, and then what do we got? Say it with me. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and father of all who is over all and through all and in all. It's one. You, you get the point of what he's trying to say? We, we're, we, we've been so fragmented. And he says, but remember, it's all one body. It's one loaf. And when we break the bread, we're still one body of Christ. This oneness unifies us and takes fragmented people all over the globe and brings them under the headship and the lordship 
of Jesus Christ. And we're all part of that. We're all connected together and drink from the same cup and eat from the same loaf and bound together mystically in Christ. See, what I love about UCM, by the way, is as I look out and I don't get to see a whole lot of people here this morning, we have a few, but when I look out normally, I love to see the diversity the different colors of people and the different clothing that they're wearing, the different denominational backgrounds that make up the UCM community of over 40 denominations and 40 different backgrounds. And uh, it's a diverse community. And even now during pandemic, I'm getting emails from all over the world. I love it. You know, I get emails from Europe and Asia and Africa and North America. I don't get a whole lot of from South America. So those of you who are from South America, give me some emails just to make me feel good about being a global community. But the idea is that we, have, we are so diverse in who we are and in our background. And, 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 but in our diversity... We're all in the same loaf, baked into the same loaf in Jesus Christ. Say to the person next to you, we're from the same loaf. <laughs> it's a good thing to be reminded of. And then if we gather Christians that aren't even part of our community and we start thinking about what's happening today in World Communion Sunday in a small village in Africa or a penthouse suite in Hong Kong, or middle America, you know, the Midwest, the Suburbans, or uh, a tribal group in Papua New Guinea, or back to Labu, Chile, or said, uh, Sindh, uh, Pakistan, wherever it is, the barrios of Brazil, we're all part of the same body of Christ. And we've been so divided by race and culture and economics and political parties and denominational preferences, it's all over the news right now. And even the body of Christ is doing it right now. We are part of the loaf. His sap that flows through you is the sap that's flowing through me. We're baked into the same bread together. We have a, I have a nephew. He's older now, but when he was little, he, only liked, he loved chicken nuggets. But he only liked one type of chicken nuggets. And they were the dinosaur chicken nuggets. <laughs> If they weren't the dinosaur chicken nuggets, he wouldn't eat them. They could be the same brand, made the exact same way. Foster Farms chicken in the United States, you know, they've got the dinosaur chickens and then the, or the chicken nuggets, and then they've got the regular chicken nuggets, and they're the exact same. The only difference is that they're in the shape of a dinosaur. And if you were to give him a regular chicken nugget that wasn't in the shape of a dinosaur, he would howl. No, it's horrible. It's awful. I can't stand these chicken nuggets. But as soon as it was in the shape of a dinosaur, all of a sudden, when it's the, an extinct animal, it becomes a delectable treat. And we used to laugh at that and say, it's from the same chickens. But it had to be a certain shape and a certain form. And his problem was he was looking at the outside shape and form instead uh, and forgetting that they're all from the same chickens. And we laugh and we say, what's wrong with this kid? And then I think we do it every Sunday. <laughs> we do it around the globe. We, we do it as we interact with people on Facebook and, and Instagram and in different ways. We, we, we divide ourselves in so many different categories into different shapes and forms and backgrounds and families. And, and we, have, we talk differently and have different likes. And then we look down on people who are in our dinosaur shape. The body of Christ teaches us we are united in Jesus Christ. See, I put number two, jot it down this morning. The Lord's Supper teaches me of my union with Christ and others. My union with Christ and others. If I am united with Christ, I'm united with you. It's the same sap that's flowing through us. And it's, it's this idea that anytime you see a believer from any part of the world, and you know they're a believer, you have an instant connection. Why? What's flowing through you is flowing through them. Think about that. The next time you see a believer from wherever, you know, from Africa, from uh, China, from wh wherever it is, uh, what's flowing through me is flowing through you. We're united in the body of Christ. Now, notice what Paul says next. Drop your eyes down to verse 26. Paul says this, he says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, underline this word, you proclaim the Lord's death 
until he comes. Circle that, proclaim, underline, highlight, asterisk, whatever you'd like to do to emphasize that word. But I, I want you to understand that Paul says here that when we take the cup, it is an act of proclamation. I like to say that the table, the cup, the bread is the first creed from the church. It, and it's not a, a creed that we say aloud. You know, we, we at Union Church of Manila, we say different creeds. We say the Apostles' Creed. We say the, um, uh, we say the Nicene Creed. We say the Chalcedonian Creed. We're, during uh, Missions Month, we had different creeds each week from different parts of the world. And what a creed is, it is a confession that says, I believe. In fact, that's what we start with. I believe in God, the Father, uh, Almighty Maker of heaven and earth. I believe. It is a statement. And, and what Paul is saying here is that when you take this, you are shouting loudly a silent creed. <laughs> you are proclaiming, I believe it. I believe that this is true. And in a world where disbelief is everywhere, that questions the beliefs that we hold on to, when you take the cup, you are making a very bold statement. And make no mistake about this. This isn't just an empty meal. It is a confessional act that I believe. You shout to the people around you, I believe that he died and that he rose. I believe that I am forgiven through the sacrifice of his blood. I believe that his, his body and his blood and the cross is the only hope for humanity. I believe that when the world is upside down, that, 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 that still, I, I, I believe in him. I, I, I believe even when the world's right side up, I believe in him. I believe. Even when I'm in the, the, the throes of doubt, I come to the table. I say, I still believe. I come to the cup and I come to the bread with this mentality. I'm proclaiming this is my hope. This is my belief. Paul says, clearly, that's what you're doing. You're proclaiming something of great significance. And I believe so much that in the presence of the people around me, and that's why I love corporate communion, because we all gather together and we take it and we're saying, looking around, we believe. We believe in this body. We believe in this blood. And we demonstrate that I not only remember the cross, but I embrace it as my own. It has real meaning to me, his blood and his body to me, that the Lord did something marvelous for me. That's why I take the cup and I proclaim it. And it not only strengthens my faith, but when I take the Lord's Supper with a large group, it encourages one another as we all say together, yes, we come to the table in belief. See, I, I put number three on your outline. Jot this down this morning. I need to remember that the Lord's table is my confession of faith. It's, it's a confession of faith. So when you're coming to the table this morning in your own homes, you're declaring to everyone in your home, I believe, and even, even if there's nobody else in your home, you're declaring to yourself and to the Lord, I believe this. It is the proclamation of the gospel that you are doing. I believe and I proclaim it. And even in the early church, you know, the early church was accused from this act of being cannibals. It does sound a little fishy, doesn't it? You're doing what? You're eating the body of somebody? You're drinking their blood? And so the non-believers around them said, yeah, the early church, they're, they're a bunch of cannibals eating people. And yet, even with that criticism, they would still go to the table and, and, and they wouldn't be deterred by this. They would come together and say, we still believe that his death and his shedding of blood paid for our sins and they're significant for us. And regardless of what you think, we still will believe. And so we come to the table, the agape table. This is why, by the way, at Union Church of Manila, we suggest that believers take the Lord's Supper. Uh, because it is believers who are proclaiming the creed of faith in Christ. And if you don't believe that, it's not that we don't want you to take it. We would love for all to partake in the Lord's Supper. All are invited. But we think you should know that when you're coming to the table, you are declaring that you believe. It is a statement of confession. 
And I've even heard of some who have made this their first statement of confession. Isn't that a great thought? No, I don't believe, I don't believe, I don't believe. And then finally, yes, Lord, I believe. And they lift the bread up and they take the cup and they declare, we believe, I believe. And maybe that's you this morning and that this is your first time and you say, yes, I believe. I believe that he died for me and I believe he suffered for me and I believe his death paid for the penalty of my sin. And if that's you, I say, go to the table and confess it this morning that you in fact believe and take it with boldness and joy and let it be your day of declaration that you too believe. See, the Lord's Supper is a proclamation of a physical creed. Now, notice this uh, next couple of verses here, verse 24 and 25. He says this, he says, we've already looked at it, but I I wanna emphasize another element here in these verses. He says, and and when he had given thanks, he, he broke it, this is the bread. So this is my body, which is for you. Now, underline this. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after the supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant of my blood, and do it as often as you drink it. And then circle it here. We do it in remembrance of him. This act is an act of remembrance. In fact, this isn't abnormal for the scripture because there are many acts of remembrance and and, um, activities of remembrance in in the scripture. I mean, you can take the Passover. It was to remind the people of the Lord's deliverance uh, from Egypt. You can take the 12 stones that were taken from the bottom of the Jordan River in the book of Joshua. And and it was to remind them how, how the Lord parted the Jordan or dried the Jordan so the people of Israel could pass by. And even, you know, later on we see people, uh, the, the Jewish uh, rabbis teaching people to wear what were called the phylacteries, which were on their hands and their foreheads to remind them of the law. It's very common that there were to be these remembrances all around us. But in the New Testament, the main remembrance here is coming to the table. And it is not that which reminds us of our deliverance of the Passover. It is that which reminds us of our deliverance of eternal life and deliverance from sin. That that it is no longer controlling us and that we have been forgiven from this and set free from sin, that we are delivered even from this earth itself, ultimately, in eternal life. And when we come to the table, we come with that mentality of remembering that Christ did all of that for us. He is our deliverer. And so when we come to the table, just, we don't come in the mentality, or we shouldn't come, I should say, With the mentality that, you know, what's waiting for me for lunch after this, you know? You know, after the sermon's finally over, what what am I going to have for lunch? Or uh, the mentality that says, I've got so much to do this week, or I've got this, or I've got that project. What am I going to do with my kids? I've got to get this project done at my house. I've got this or that. Our minds, we, we live sort of in this frenetic pace that we are in. We come to the table. It is a sacred moment where we are called to remember in the middle of the chaos and the bustle of this world to put all of that aside and say, we remember you that you have delivered us and set aside everything else in our frenetic minds and think of what his body and his blood means to us and all to he, all humanity. To remember the wonderful work of our savior and elevate him and bring that very near to us. In fact, um, I, I wanna illustrate it as best as I can this way. Uh, uh, our youth director, Edric, before, my, my, my family is in the States right now. They're, they've been away for a while. They're going to be away for a while. And so Edric, being a kind and compassionate youth pastor, said, I, I'm going to make you something. And he made these dolls for all of our people in our family. And they look like each of the people in our family. And so they, he made a doll, the, the Chad Williams doll. And, and there's the Chad Williams doll. And the idea of the Chad Williams doll was that the kids would take dad with them everywhere they went so that they're not going alone but they're bringing dad into the every moment that they are away from him 
So, you know, there they are on the, on the airplane. There's dad and they're taking these pictures and they're sending me pictures every day. Dad, we were here and, and we brought dad to do this and dad got frozen yogurt and dad went to the park with us and, and dad was with us. And it's them saying, we remember you, dad. You're so important to us. We, your presence is with us. And I think although this illustration is quite complete in the total meaning of the Lord's table, I think in essence, when we come to the table, we're bringing the presence of Christ near at a most basic level. We're expressing our deep love for him and, and coming him, bringing him close, fully embracing him and his presence and fully inviting him into the activity of the moment. And we remember him that he is with us. For, uh, the fourth thing on your outline this morning, jot it down. The Lord's table reminds me of his presence. And it's presence with me and it reminds me of what he's done. And I come to the table remembering his presence and his work through the table. Finally, last part, look at verse 27 through verse 29. It says this, it says, whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself, underline that, examine themselves then so to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. There's two words. First of all, there's examine. And then second of all, there is the unworthy manner. Now the question is, how do you come to the table in an unworthy manner? When I was a kid, we were taught, you know, if you had a bad week and did some sin, had some sin in your life, you don't come to the table. Well, I discovered I could never come to the table because I always had sin in my life. And so it seemed like every time I come to the table, I would be scared to death to take it because I had sin in my life and I was imperfect. And so I never took from the table. I was terrified. That's not what Paul is talking about here. In fact, I love how the, the Scottish theologian, his John Duncan, he was in the church. He's from the College of Edinburgh. He was conducting a service one day and a, a, a young girl comes into the back of the, the service and comes late in and he sees that she is definitely not good Christian material, right? And she sits down and, and they're taking the Lord's Supper and, and it's going, all these elements are going out and, and she's crying and, and the, the, the tray comes in front of her and she passes and she says no. And he, he looks at the pulpit and he, this agitates him, it irritates him that somebody would, would pass on that. And so he goes and he puts it in front of her and she says, no, I can't. You don't understand. He says, take it, lassie. It's for sinners. That's the reality of it, right? We, we come to the table because we are sinners and we understand that in this table, we are made holy, that we are cleansed of our sin and we are established as new people. That's the whole point of it all. You come to the table knowing that you're a sinner. And we say, God, forgive me, help me. This is the only hope that I have in my sinful life is from your table. So what's Paul talking about? Coming in an unworthy manner. I think it's just exactly what he's been talking about in this text. There's four things, right? We've already talked about them. If you're not willing to serve others, he says, get the serving thing down <laughs> and then come and take from the table. Start serving one another. Commit to serving one another. And then he says, if you can't proclaim that you believe in the cross, then it doesn't mean anything for you. Don't, don't do that. Or if you're not unified, if you don't understand that you are part of Christ and part of one another, then taking it in an unworthy manner. And finally, if you're not remembering the work, if you just come and say, oh, a little bread, a little, a little juice, he says that's an unworthy manner. You see, this is a sacred act. And we come with our, a mindset that says this is one of the most important things that we do in our, our, our faith and, and how we express our faith. See, the event, no matter whatever background that you have, whatever persuasion you have, it's an important part of our faith that's been celebrated for 2,000 years. And we get to do that together this morning with believers all around the globe. And it's an important event for our lives. So as we come to the table, we come with reverence as millions of others come to the table today. And before taking, I invite you to reflect on your own life. Paul says here, right? What does he say? He says, examine yourself and see what it is that the Lord is speaking to you. Are you serving your brothers and sisters? Can you say with confidence, I believe. 
Do you have the mentality that says, I will remember and bring close Christ? And then I invite you to the table. Lord, unworthy we are to come to the table this morning, but you invite us to come. And so, Lord, we will obey. Thank you for the table. Thank you for the cup and thank you for the bread, for your body and for your blood. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus, draw me ever near as I
We come now to this time of communion. This is a time of supper with the Lord, a time to receive once more of His hospitality. And we do this now uh, on this World Communion Sunday, remembering that we take communion not as one family in Union Church, but we take communion with the Lord and with one another, with people of the worldwide church. Brothers and sisters of all nations, united in Christ together to participate in this set-apart time with Him and with one another. So as we come once more to the table, let us remember what we're doing. And let us first, before we partake of the bread and the cup, let us pray. Will you pray with me? Lord, uh, we, we come once more and, and we, do help, we do ask that you help us to imagine that we are, are one family united around the globe, around the world, Lord. And this is powerful. We are united in, in you. We are united in one faith. And Lord, we come to this time We believe that you want to commune with us, that you want to impart your truth, your great love to us, that you want to seal us once more with your great love, with your grace. And so we come to your table now. We thank you that you invite us, that the invitation is always open, and we come with all our brothers and sisters. We come as individuals as well. And we trust that you, will, you are with us, you will serve us, and, and remind us as you wish for us to be reminded of you. So, Lord, be with us especially now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So the Lord was gathered with his disciples at that, at that last Passover meal before he would go on to be arrested and tried and eventually crucified. He was with them at the table. And he first, before um, anything, anything else, he took the bread from the table. And what he did first was he gave thanks to God the Father for it. And then before them, he broke it. And he offered it to each one of them gathered there. And he said, this is my body. It's broken for you. Take of it, eat of it, and when you do, do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup from the table and he said, this cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood, poured out for you for the forgiveness of sin. Take from it, drink from it, And when you do, you do this in remembrance of me. Whenever we eat of the bread and we drink of the cup, in a way, we proclaim God's great love for us, that he gave of himself fully in Christ, body and blood, so that we may have life, that we may have a true life, and that we may have it in abundance. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Hagan esto en memoria mía. Jesus suo, i ruci zuo, se wei zhe zi nian wo. Watashi o oboete, kore o okonai nasai. Hai lam shu nai den yo den ta. E yon su o mea bo zamete, misimanie ma eti. Perbuatla ini, menjadi peringatan akan aku. Masih kiri mempunyai semuanya situ kerana. Fait ceci en mémoire de moi. Buat ini demi memperingati aku. Miwa esia na miya kodongku jinya. Gawin ninyo ito sa pag-ala-ala sa akin. We take your body and we take your blood in remembrance of you.
Before we take the benediction together, if there is more information that you want to know about your journey, having a starting a journey with Christ, or if you have a specific need in your life that you would like somebody to be praying with you about, we would encourage you to reach out to Union Church of Manila. There's email addresses on the screen here, and, and we would encourage you to shoot off an email right away. We would love to be able to pray with you about your relationship with Christ, your growing in Christ, or any of the needs that you have in your life. We have people who would love to be able to reach out to you or pray with you about certain things. So please these, uh, reach out. We would love to hear from you. Now let's receive our morning benediction together. Now may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Jesus Christ that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless and have a great week. Thank you for joining us in today's worship service. My name is Caleb. I'm a missions volunteer. The youth ministry invites students in grades 7 to 12 for youth online service and fellowship every Wednesday at 7 p.m. and Sundays at 10 a.m. For updates, like Disciples of Christ United on Facebook or follow us on Instagram. Come and join us for a time of scriptural reflection and prayer during the midweek essentials, Wednesdays at 11 a.m. We would love to hear from you and find out how you're doing. Please do connect with us. If you need prayer for any reason, just email ucmcares at unionchurch.ph. There are many ways of giving your offering to the church, such as via direct bank deposits or through online transactions. You may also drop your offering or pledges at UCM anytime. If you need to remain at home, please call the church to arrange for your checks to be picked up. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Join us again next Sunday to celebrate UCM's 106th anniversary. Let's praise and worship our Lord Jesus Christ together. God bless.